welcome everybody to the AgriFutures Australia IHVT or um, uh, IHVT webinar program or virtual field day. Um, I am going to just give a welcome and then a, uh, a bit of housekeeping before I introduce uh, a couple of our project team. And then I'm going to be handing over to Mark Skews, who will be our chair and facilitator for the day. So my name is Olivia Reynolds. I'm the Senior Manager for Emerging Industries in AgriFutures Australia. And, and welcome again to you all. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders on the lands on which we all gather in our respective states and territories today. I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So just a few housekeeping items um, before we get underway. We're going to be, or we are recording this session today. So if you do not wish to be identified, please de-identify yourself online and turn off your camera as we will be uploading a copy of this webinar to our website. So the way we're going to proceed today is uh, if you could ask questions using the chat function at the top of your bars, type them in and I will be assisting Mark um, when it comes to question time after each of the speakers by identifying those questions. We will keep a record of those questions um, if we are not able to get to them all today uh, and we, might, we will be able to um, assist later on. Uh, speakers, could you please all ensure that your cameras are switched on while you are presenting and also during the Q&A sessions? Um, the rest of the members, you're welcome to have your camera on or off. Uh, but if we could ask if everyone could please ensure that they are muted unless they are speaking throughout. Thank you. So the um, Industrial Hemp Variety Trials or IHVT is a partnership between AgriFutures Australia, the Northern Territory Government and all state government org organisations accepting New South Wales and Queensland currently. So the purpose of our IHVT trials is to provide Australian hemp growers with independent information about the performance of new industrial hemp seed varieties across regions and sowing times. And while Queensland and New South Wales are currently not, uh, have not been part of our first year trials, we are having very encouraging discussions and we hope that we will be able to bring them on for our second and third seasons. All of our trial designs are designed by biometricians, so they're scientifically robust replicated designs and they will be analysed. Uh, so with that, we do have uh, some really solid outputs um, for these trials. And all of the samples that are taken throughout the trials, and Mark will go into some more detail about these later, uh, are done by analyt Analytical Services Tasmania to ensure consistency. So I'd just like to also um, point to two of our key people that uh, work very closely with us at AgriFutures to run this program. So Mark Skews from SARDI is our IHVT coordinator. And as I mentioned, he will be our chair and facilitator today. So Mark is a research yeah, scientist with the South Australian Research and Development Institute, or SARDI, a business unit um, uh, within South Australian government. Mark has been based at the Lockskin Research Centre since 1988 and has many years of experience in irrigated horticultural research and production and extension. Mark ran the South Australian government funded industrial hemp trials from 2017 until 2021 and he is our coordinator so we're really pleased to have him on board and he also oversees both the Loxton and the Myope South Australian trial sites. We also have online with us today our IHVT agronomist, so John Muir from Hemp Farming Systems. John has been an agronomist for in all his 32 uh, year career, initially with New South Wales Department of Primary Industries as a district and extension agronomist uh, in the Riverina, then with the land care and catchment management groups in southeast Queensland. And this also included some international stints uh, in Cambodia. So since, since 2009, John has been involved in the development of the Australian hemp industry, starting as an agronomist for Ecofiber, coordinating the production of several biomass crops for the first Australian fibre mill in the Hunter Valley and seed production crops in all the east coast uh, states of Australia, including Tasmania. 
For the last four years, he has been the lead agronomist at Hemp Farming Systems, an independent consultancy service based in southeast Queensland, uh, with both national and international clients, including this uh, AgriFutures IHVT program. So um, just before we proceed and I hand over to Mark, were there any questions? Um, and if so, could you just pop them in the chat? Um, if you have any questions or clarity before we go on, I'll just give you a moment. And good morning. Thank you, Maggie Davidson from the Blue Mountains. <laughs> All right, we will we'll proceed. So um, I'm now going to hand over to Mark Skews, who's going to um, take you through our program for today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Olivia. Um, just before we get going, um, Beck and Bonnie, um, I'm just getting messages from both Jason and Shah Jahan who are having difficulty joining us. Um, so can you send yeah, got it. Links, links to them and make sure they can join us? Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that uh, this morning is going to be of great interest to everyone. Um, talking about the Industrial Hemp Variety Trials program that AgriFutures um, are sponsoring and um, uh, co-funding with various state governments. So the outline of what we're going to cover today um, should be on your screens. Uh, so we've, we've had a background and introduction from Olivia. Uh, I'll give a bit of an overview of the trial program and then we'll go on some virtual field visits. Uh, so we'll go to each of the five central and southern zone sites. Uh, the managers, site managers of those sites will um, talk to us and show us around the sites. A couple of those will be video, uh, recorded videos, and uh, the others will be uh, PowerPoint presentations. Uh, John Muir will give us a bit of a discussion about agronomic issues that have um, come up during the trial so far. Um, and then I'll do a bit of a wrap up and what, where to next. Um, now I can hear a bit of noise in the background, so uh, just a reminder if you can please mute yourselves um, so that we're not getting those uh, interferences and everyone can hear clearly, that would be uh, much appreciated. Thank you very much. And um, as uh, Olivia said, there's an opportunity to uh, ask questions uh, by uh, using the chat box on the um, meeting. Okay, so I will move straight on to the overview um, and uh, there'll be opportunity for questions uh, generally after that. So introduction to the IHVT or overview of the program. Um, so we are running the whole program using um, a set of trial pro protocols. Um, and those protocols, as well as providing some information uh, such as background and definitions of uh, the things that we're talking about, it covers issues like supply of seed for the trial plantings, uh, the setup of the trial sites, collection of data and an analysis of the data, regulatory compliance uh, of those trial sites with the state legislation. As you'll be aware, uh, legislation in each state tends to differ. Um, and then also data publication. And we review those annually. Well, we will review them annually. So this has been the first year um, we've put those trial protocols together as a, um, uh, a joint effort between the, the uh, trial providers. Um, but uh, they will be reviewed annually and we'll update them as we go. So there are currently seven uh, trial sites involved in the uh, Industrial Hemp Variety Trials Program. We have two in the northern zone at Catherine and Kununurra. Now, those sites currently don't have any crop in the ground and we won't be talking about them today, but they are about to commence planting in those two sites. In the central zone, uh, we have Manjum up in WA and Loxton in South Australia. And in the southern zone, we have Myope in SA Hamilton in Victoria and Epping Forest in Tasmania. Now, Olivia mentioned that uh, we don't currently have Queensland or New South Wales involved in the program, which is obviously something that we desire and that uh, you know, those discussions are ongoing. Um, in terms of when those crops are being grown, uh, these are the planting dates. 
And I guess the, the key thing to note there is that in the central and southern zones, we're planting generally uh, November, December. Um, and at Hamilton, we've also got an October planting as a um, just to, to test whether that earlier planting might be suitable. Um, in the northern zone, we're planting um, April, May, um, and there'll be an early April planting in Kununurra, uh, so in a few days' time, um, and then later in April and in May. So the, the seasons are different. Uh, one of the key things to say here, I guess, is that we're looking at irrigated production, so it's summer production in the central and southern, and it's dry season production in the north. Varieties uh, that are currently in the program for this year, um, so we have uh, half a dozen suppliers there um, and a range of varieties um, and so I just acknowledge those providers and thank them for their involvement with uh, the program and their provision of seed to the program. In terms of those varieties, so there are two columns of varieties here and just giving some of the detail on uh, what those varieties are all about. So for example there we've got some Canadian, French, Chinese, Polish, uh, and Australian varieties in the program this year. Uh, and they're roughly half and half dioecious and monoecious varieties. Um, not all of those varieties are being grown in every location though. So um, the seed suppliers uh, basically said, we're happy to provide variety, this variety to be grown in this region. Uh, because we think that it'll perform well there. Uh, and so there are different varieties in different regions. You can see there which ones uh, are where. And there are four of those varieties that are being grown at every site, which is great, gives us a really good opportunity to compare their performance across quite different uh, climate. Um, but some of the varieties are only being grown uh, in either the northern zone or the central and southern zones. So that gives a Okay, I think we have temporarily, unfortunately, lost Mark. Um, we'll just give him a moment. I'm sure he will be back on. <laughs> Beck, are you able to raise his PowerPoint uh, in the meantime, just in case we have any challenges there? He's coming back in now. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I think I hit a wrong button. Oh, <laughs> <didn't okay>. <laughs> uh, uh, apologies to everyone. Um, so uh, that that gives a, a brief summary of the overview of the project um, and uh, what's happening. I, I don't doesn't look like there are any questions yet. Um, I give you a, a second to think about that. Um, whether there are any general questions you want to ask. Um, if not, we're probably ready to move on to our first field visit. So our first field visit is going to be to uh, Manjimup. So Shah Jahan Mian is uh, a hemp research scientist with the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development in Western Australia. He's also the site manager for the Manjimup uh, trial site. Um, Dajahan happens to be in Bangladesh at the moment, so he has pre recorded a video of uh, the trial site at Manjimup, uh, but he is online and ready to answer questions if there are any uh, when that video is completed. So, uh, Beck, if you can run the video. Thank you. I am Shah Jahan Mian, research scientist, Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. I would like to welcome you all at the Menjimap Research Station in the Department of Primary Industries and Regional Development. And Menjimap is located 
almost 315 kilometers south of Perth. And I am going to give you a little bit of background what we have done so far over the last two years on industrial hemp research. And we have done a couple of seeding red trials and also time of sowing with the different cultivars in the south at Menjibab and in the north at Kananara. And we have identified few cultivars are looking very promising and also with the optimum time of seeding. I am going to give you basic information about the trial site. We have chosen this site at Menjimap Research Station Farm. And this soil is very good. And we have collected soil samples before putting our trial. And soil properties are looking good, but P has a little bit lower end. Uh, that's why we have put five tons of lime to increase the soil pH. And that land is uh, ploughed uh, by the tulip disc at 10 centimeter depth. And also we have incorporated that lime by the tulip disc at 10 centimeter. Then we rolled up the land by the big paddock roller. Then we have used our cone seeder to do our seeding. This trial, we are fortunate to have eight cultivars, and they are from China, Australia, France, Canada, and Poland. And we have done the first time of sowing in 3rd of November, and second time of sowing in 2nd of December. And our cone seeder, has eight rows and each row spacing is 18 centimeters. And we have targeted the planting depth at one to two centimeters. That's all we have done. And also we have uh, used glyphosate to control the existing weeds. And also we use the fertilizer as they required based on the soil properties. And we have done that one during the seeding time, as well as split application by hand at three weeks after seeding and five weeks another top dress by hand. That is muriate of potash and urea. We don't like to see crops are suffering from any nutrition deficit. And also we are using the sprinkler, overhead sprinkler, and it is coming frequently based on the soil temperature and the evaporation rate. We are fortunate to have a trial at Menjimab this year in the south, and one will be coming in the north very soon, might be 15th of March. We are going to start our time of sowing one, then followed by another month, two and three. And the king will be responsible to conduct the trial at Kananara. As I mentioned, RD1 is the X59, CRS1, CFX2, and Katani. And the middle maturity one, Henola and Ferrimon. And the long maturity one, I am in front of the Han Annie, which is only 90 days after seeding. You can have a look. And we have also male flowers in front of me. You can see they are going to die, and some are already dead. And we are targeting to have at least 40% male and 60% female, which we will get more gain yield and what we are looking for our trial at Menjimap at this moment. And we are very fortunate to have this hen and e and ruby in our trial to see how does it look. And we would like to see they are in height was might be one meter on 1.5, but uh, some are 1.8 up to 2.1 meters. And some, the short maturity one, they are very short as for example, Katani and X59. And they are not up to that uh, mark in terms of plant establishment. We have done the plant establishment count and poor establishment counts are from Katani, X59, and CRS1 little bit and uh, CFX2. 
but others are not bad at this moment. But we have to improve our game a little bit in terms of plant establishment. If we achieve 60 or 70 percent of our target plant density as we targeted, 100 viable seeds per square meter, we would love to have at least 60 or 70 percent, but unfortunately we didn't achieve that one. And we have a little bit problem with herbicide in our uh, time of sowing one trial, but in time of sowing two, they are very clean. And we didn't use any post-emergence herbicides as we don't have any more options to control post-emergence uh, herbicides uh, to be used in industrial hemp. And always we are very fortunate, all the cultivars are less than 0.3% uh, THC level, which is very good. And uh, we are going to have uh, our plant samples to be sent to the chemistry lab for THC. Also the grain quality um, uh, for protein, hectoliter oil, oil content, and thousand grain oil. And that will be gone very soon to the chemistry lab after we harvest hen and, and uh, ruby. And they are looking good and you can see all are very clean and we are very fortunate to uh, harvest might be another month time hopefully. Seeds are still in dough, a soft dough. Hopefully uh, um, they will be ready within four to six weeks time. And we have a little bit problem with the birds but uh, we didn't observe any disease or insect damage, which is very good. But some stage we have seen wingless uh, grasshopper. Uh, now they are gone and we have uh, now problem with the parrots and we put the gas gun to control the plants from the parrots, which is very good. And uh, we love to harvest uh, the remaining two cultivars hen and e and ruby within four to six weeks time. Thank you. Thank you, Beck, for running that. Um, so there's Shah Jahan's Manjum Up trial. Um, he's giving you quite a bit of information about the trial and how things are going there. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, Mark, still nothing in the chat? Mark, we do have one from oh, earlier. Um, are the varieties public or proprietary? Uh, I believe there's a mix. Um, I... They've been nominated by particular companies. Um, so we have uh, material transfer agreements with those companies um, and uh, those companies have the rights to uh, provide those seeds. Um, but I'm not sure of the ones we've got, which ones are private and which are public. John, do you have a, uh, any idea on that? You'll need to unmute Thanks. yourself. Yep. Thanks, Mark. Yes. Um, there are definitely both private and public varieties. Maybe we should publish that as part of this document. I think we could do that, yes. Yep. So if there's any further questions, we do have Shaha Jahan online to answer about um, the Western Australian trial site in Manjama or indeed um, the soon to be planted uh, site in Kununurra. Please do add them into the chat. Nothing further at the moment, Mark. Okay. Oh, oh we do have a question. <laughs> How do we become part of the trial for Queensland? <laughs> <laughs> Talk to Olivia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Peter, if you would like to reach out to, um, to myself, AgriFutures, um, we can have a conversation. You can email us at the program's email. Beck will pop that into the chat box. Thanks. All right. Okay, so if there are no further questions about that, I will um, talk about the Loxton trial site. 
So um, Olivia introduced me before, but I um, work at Loxton Research Centre uh, with uh, SARDI, South Australian Research and Development Institute, um, which is part of Primary Industries Department. Um, and I oversee both the Loxton and Man um, MyOP trial sites. Uh, so I'll speak now about the Loxton trial site and what's happening there. Get this to move. There we go. Um, so quickly, um, we have been doing industrial hemp uh, trials at Loxton for the last few years. Uh, so we've done four seasons of trials prior to this at two sites, uh, Loxton and in the southeast of South Australia at Kaibu Bolite and then Myote. Um, variety in time of, uh, time of sowing comparisons. Um, and we did initially look at quite a range of times of sowing uh, across from mid-October through to January. Um, but uh, we reduced that down to two in later years and the ideal timing for us seems to be around November and December. Um, which is uh, where we've continued to work in the IHVT trials as well. And there is a report available online for that previous work. Um, if you go to the Primary Industries um, and Regions website, pir.sa.gov.au, um, go to the Primary Industry area and there's an industrial hemp page um, and you'll find a link to the uh, industrial Hemp Trials Update Report. So if you want more information on those trials, that's there. Um, as a result of th those trials, uh, we were then um, pretty keen to be part of the IHVT program when that uh, was first proposed. Um, and so we have joined in with that and our Loxton trial site, which is the same site that we've been using for the last four years, uh, is uh, located here, so, so it's minus 34.4 degrees latitude, 140.6 degrees longitude. A um, bit of information about the site. The soils here in the Riverland are fairly sandy. Um, so we've got uh, sandy clay loam topsoil. There is underlying carbonate layer, but it's a free draining carbonate layer. So we've got quite a depth of uh, free draining sandy soil. You can see there um, how sandy it is uh, when it's worked up. The soil preparation for the trial site was to plough the site to control weeds. So we, we didn't have, we had a bit of cover crop in there prior, but um, we have some significant weed issues, one of which is cow crop. Uh, anyone who's familiar with that in an irrigated, summer irrigated production system will know that it's, um, it's pretty awful to control. So um, we have uh, we, we need to control that any way we can prior to sowing. We have had issues uh, across a number of years with the furrows that uh, because we, we plough the soil then we sow into that ploughed soil, we get reasonably deep furrows even though we're uh, planting fairly shallow seed. Um, and those furrows can fill up with drift sand if we have uh, a north wind um, comes through and blows sand around, and that can cause issues with um, emergence of the, the hemp seedlings. Uh, just a quick visual here of the trial plot layout. Um, so this is our trial site from the air. Uh, we've got two times of sowing, and we've separated those uh, so that we're not getting any competition issues from uh, established plants with our new seedlings. Within those time of sowing treatments, we've got four replicates uh, in, within each time of sowing. And within each replicate, we've then got six varieties uh, randomised within that replicate. Now, you may notice that uh, things look a little different from side to side. We had a couple of issues here which are just worth mentioning. First one is we had a GPS fail. So the guys who came to sow this for me um, set up their GPS and away they went and the first run they did was not straight. So the GPS setup didn't work um, and uh, we ended up with some, some wonky looking uh, trial site but uh, we ran with it anyway so um, that, that happens. 
the more concerning issue, I guess, was that they also had a cedar blockage, which they didn't pick up at the time. Uh, so the time of sowing, first time of sowing, we actually had blockage on half of the furrow, half of the um, tines on the, the cedar. Um, and so we only ended up with our plots being three rows wide instead of six, which is unfortunate, but we didn't uh, realise that until we started to get uh, emergence and there was only uh, emergence in three out of six rows. So these things happen um, and uh, we push forward uh, anyway. So trial plot layout, plot dimensions, we've got 30 centimetre row width on our uh, planting rows. Um, and we do actually want to look at getting a different piece of machinery next year so we can close that up a bit. Six planting rows, or should have been six planting rows. Uh, in the trauma sowing one, it's only three. Um, so that gives a 1.8 metre plot width for a full plot, 10 metres long, uh, so they're 18 square metres in the plot. The irrigation system is overhead sprinklers. Um, so we're using some Nelson rotator sprinklers uh, on three metre rises. Uh, so in past years with our state funded projects, we've had varieties like the Han and E that um, Sharjah Han was talking about earlier. Um, and they grew to over three metres tall uh, in our first trial. Uh, so we needed to get our sprinklers well high to get above that. Uh, we're at a 10 by 12 metre spacing, so we're putting on 6.45 millimetres per hour with those sprinklers. Um, and then we can give you know, a couple of hours at a time to give us um, 12 or 13 mils of, of irrigation at a time. You can see the uh, sprinkler rises here in this shot of the trial site um, and how, so that, how that's laid out relative to the plots. Sowing times, we sowed on the 16th of November and the 7th of December last year. And these are the varieties that we have at this site. So we've got CFX2, CRS1, Ferriman 12, Hanola, Katani and X59. Um, so mostly Canadian varieties, a French and a Polish, uh, and half and half grain in dual purpose. Four of those varieties are dioecious, uh, so we have the separate male and female plants, and two of them are monoecious, so we've got male and female flowers on the same plants. And as it's turned out, the monoecious varieties have also turned out to be the later varieties um, within the six that we've got at this site. Some of the learnings from uh, our experience this year. Uh, so we targeted a plant density of 100 plants per square metre and our measured plant density 21 days after sowing was anything from 12 plants to 131 plants. Um, so we did have some major issues in establishment. Seed quality was a major contributor to that. Um, so not so much variety as such, but the quality of the seed that we received in a couple of cases was really not great. We did pre-sowing germination tests to check the germination rate um, and we accounted for that. So we had some poor germination in, in a couple of varieties and we accounted for that by increasing the seeding rate. But that didn't account for the fact that the, uh, the plants, sorry, the um, seeds that did germinate, the seedling vigour was actually quite poor. And so a lot of those uh, seeds that germinated did not establish as plants. So we ended up with quite low uh, plant density in some of those uh, plots. So that is an issue going forward for the, the program that we need to have good quality, vigorous seed um, to, to be able to do these comparisons uh, fairly because those two varieties aren't performing well, it's, it's because of the seed that we received rather than the variety per se. We control. Um, this is just a shot of the, the soil in a uh, high plant count plot, looking through to the next plot where the plant count is quite low. And you can see in the foreground, there's very little weed 
um, growth under the plants, and these have not had any herbicide. Um, but in the background where there's more sunlight coming through because there uh, aren't enough hemp plants, uh, we've got all sorts of weeds uh, growing there and competing with our hemp crop. Um, and this is an ongoing issue that we've had over, over years. Um, that if you can get a good stand of uh, hemp plants established, they can uh, provide a good smothering of weeds. Um, but if you don't, then um, there are, are significant issues. And the final learning, uh, we've got grass parrots here that uh, love hemp. Um, uh, they seem to go for certain varieties. So this is Ferrum 12 and they were having a great feast on that. Um, we did have a couple of other pest issues. Uh, so we had some, some caterpillars and grubs, um, which we used both the BT and the virus on. Um, and we've had some um, rather glen bugs, uh, but not too bad this year. But I know that's been an issue everywhere uh, across the country with hemp this year, uh, that rather glen bugs have been uh, quite a problem. Okay. So that's the Loxton trial site summary. Um, I should say, I guess, um, and maybe should have mentioned this earlier, that we have harvested most of the central and southern trial sites. So Shah Jahan is still waiting for his uh, Hanani and um, Ruby to mature. Um, but we ha we're in the process still of extracting, the, uh, threshing the seed um, and uh, getting yield data. So we don't actually have any data as such to, to present, um, but uh, we... Um, I guess what we're doing today is really to take the place of an in-person field day, which under COVID conditions has been a bit of an issue. Um, so we're, we're um, taking you on a field tour instead. So Olivia, I believe there was a question. Yes, Mark, we've got a few questions that have come through. Look, there's a few around scope. So um, perhaps if you could articulate what is and isn't in scope for this trial in terms of what are we measuring? Um, and what are we um, ultimately hoping to provide our stakeholders? Okay. Yep. So the scope of the IHVT, I guess, is um, it's focusing on seed, hemp seed production uh, and measuring that specifically. And so the varieties that we're looking to use are grain varieties or dual purpose. So we're not looking specifically at fibre production in this project. Um, so we're measuring um, the, the growth and development of the crop. We're measuring seed yield. We will be measuring, uh, we are measuring total biomass so we can get a um, harvest index. Um, but, uh, and, and then the, the grain will go to the lab for uh, oil content, protein content, um, and seed size and test weight of the seed. Um, does that cover, uh, again, I guess uh, I did mention earlier too that we're looking at irrigated um, summer or dry season production as well. Uh, you're on mute, I think, Olivia. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> um, another question is, can we determine the ideal planting date for each variety from these trials? Um, I guess we're, we're looking at a, a limited number of, of planting dates um, and we will be able to say, you know, for a particular site that certain varieties perform better at uh, the earlier or later planting date. Um, but we, I guess the, there's a limitation on how many um, times of sowing we can do uh, because each time you add a time of sowing, you add multiple plots and, and a lot of work to that. Uh, so. At this stage, we're mostly looking at three or two or three planting dates that we think are reasonable and, and should be uh, appropriate for most varieties. Um, but you know, in anything, I guess we need to um, work out what our best guess is and run with that and see how that works. Uh, as I said, the, the protocols will be reviewed annually, so that that's one of the things that will be up for discussion. Um, and it might be at certain sites that we do decide that we need to go earlier or later. 
Okay, we've got a couple of uh, questions around the seed germination rate and seedling vigour and whether this is due to older seed or, or another issue. And also, was this um, a general observation across a number of our um, seeds? It was. So the same varieties had issues at all five sites. So it is the seed um, that's the problem. It's not um, anything that's happened at a particular site. Um, so seed can be, um, it, it, it may be older seed. It may be the way the seed has been stored um, and, uh, and not, you know, perhaps not cared for um, as it could have been. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a number of issues that, that can lead to those issues and, and sometimes that can happen in transit as well. Um, we've had issues previously where seed has been perfectly good when it left the supplier and has been rubbish when it got to us. So something happened in, in transit, but in this case it, it does seem to be consistent. So, uh, yeah, and, and I think age of seed is a key, but not just age, it's how it's stored and, and cared for in storage that that will retain the vigour or can lead to um, you know, reduction in, in vigour and germination rate of seed. Thanks, Mark. Uh, we've got another question. Have any of the crops gone close to or over the state defined limits for THC? So as far as I know, no, they haven't. Um, but our own THC samples are still waiting to go to the lab. We're having some um, some delays in getting the, the in the lab getting themselves uh, ready to take the seed, uh, sorry, the, the flower heads. Um, so we don't have those results ourselves yet. Some of the crops will have been tested as a matter of course by the state uh, authorities, um, and I haven't heard that any of them have raised any red flags. So at this stage, no, we haven't had any problems. Thanks, uh, Mark. That's brought us to the end of um, the questions at the moment. OK. All right. Thank you for that. So we will now move on to the southern zone uh, and we'll go to Hamilton. Uh, so Penny Rifkin is a senior research scientist in grains and agronomy with the Agriculture Victoria Research Group. Uh, she's based at Hamilton in Victoria and manages the IHVT trial site at Hamilton. Um, and so Penny's going to talk to us about that site. Penny. Thanks, Mark. I'll just... You see that? It's working okay? Yep, that's good. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so yes, yeah, so as Mark said, um, we have a trial site, the Victorian trial site, uh, based at Hamilton. Should move on. Uh, so yes, in southwest Victoria, um, uh, and this is a picture of our our trial site. So we're we're at about um, thirty seven by one forty two um, latitude longitude. Uh, the soil type that we are on is reasonably typical as the major soil type of southwest Victoria. Uh, so this is a soil core to 180 centimetres depth at the different increments. So you can see uh, from this graph on the clay percentage that it's the very strong textural contrasting soil. So the top, uh, say, sort of 50 centimetres is a, generally a, a sandy loam, and then we hit a, a quite a heavy clay content um, after that. Also, usually at around about that sort of 30 to 50 or 100 centimetre um, depth, then we, we do get quite a lot of buckshot in that. After that, the clay becomes heavier, and then at depth, you can see that sort of bleaching of the clay which indicates waterlogging. So we at our site we have about uh, just less than 700 millimetres um, of rainfall a year, but majority of that occurs in winter. So we have a lot of um, waterlogging over winter, but over summer that's not generally an issue. We, we have um, winter dominant rainfall pattern. The pH um, it is tends to be a little bit acidic at the top um, horizon, but then it does become neutral down 
the profile. The experimental design, similar as to Mark's at Loxton for replicates, we had actually three times of sewing on our trial. The first one was on the 21st of October, the second on the 18th of November, and the third on the 8th of December. Within that, uh, those sewing times, we had six varieties, same same varieties as Mark had at, at Loxton. Um, and these were um, sewn in three rows, so the outside rows were considered to be buffers and then we had a, a, a buffer down the middle so we had um, three three um, drill runs per variety and then as the trial was progressing we had some yellowing in the trial and weren't sure what that was so we sent some tissue samples away for analysis um, and also decided to put some fertilizer out so we put the fertilizer out on that um, in a plot next to the buffer areas in the trial. And um, we only applied that fertiliser on the second and third time of sowing uh, because it was a little bit too late on that first time when we, we um, got the results back and decided what to put on. So prior to sowing, the, um, we did some soil tests and did a little bit of amelioration prior to the trial going in. So it was, as I said, we do have a tendency to have a bit of um, sub top surface acidity. So we applied two and a half tonnes of lime, 50 kilograms per hectare of um, sulphate of potash um, phosphorus and 50 kilograms of urea, which was broadcast on and then incorporated with power harrows. The seed we received was treated with um, apron and the knockdown herbicide we used was glyphosate. We did not put any pre-emergent herbicide on the trial. We were a bit nervous of um, getting some residual effect and there was no herbicide applied within the trial either. So at the three different sowing times, um, the crops were sown at about sort of one to two centimetres depth, at 15 centimetre row spacings, um, eight rows per um, run with 100 kil kilograms per hectare of MAP. And then in trial on that second and third sowing time, we addi added ad additional fertilizer, um, urea and granular, which was hand, again, granular sulfate of ammonia, which was hand broadcast and also a foliar um, application, which was applied split plot. So because we applied just next to the buffer, we had one area that had fertilizer and one that didn't have fertilizer. So we could do a, a bit of a comparison with the fertilizer treatments. We also um, applied um, insecticide uh, to control um, pests. The soil moisture, uh, we did some initial soil tests to see the starting soil moisture, but in the trial, we applied drip irrigation and the idea was to provide non-limiting for crop growth. We used um, green brain for irrigation scheduling. So we had a had sensors on this photograph on the right. You can see um, a sensor in the ground, which was had three gypsum blocks attached to it at 10 centimetres, 30 centimetres and 60 centimetres of depth. They were logging every 10 minutes. And so we based our scheduling on the soil profile drying out. Our target was to maintain the soil at a moisture level less than um, 100 kilopascals of <clears throat> soil moisture tension. And these lines here indicate um, the orange is the 10 centimetre, blue is 30, green is 60 centimetre. And where it drops off, this is um, the, where, where the irrigation was applied or at um, or rainfall events. The harvest period, uh, we turned off the irrigation just at harvest. Um, once the crops had come off and you can see that uh, the soil did dry out, they were still green, so it did dry out afterwards. Um, and the, you could see that, you know, even at the 60 centimetre depth, we were getting that drying down, which indicates that the roots are going at least to 60 centimetres. The weed and pest issues we, we had, as 
Mark's observation where we had poor establishment, shorter plants um, the, the, we, that were not able to compete. We had a big problem with wireweed, but where we had good vigour, high, you know, taller plants, and there was a lot better weed control. As I said, we had applied no, apart from the initial knockdown glyphosate, we applied no pre-emergent or, or in-crop herbicides. We did have issues with Rutherglen bud, buds, bugs and um, heliothus um, and also red-legged earth mites at sowing. And the we noticed these fairly, they came in and we had quite heavy infestations, but we got onto, the guys got onto it pretty quickly and um, the, herbis, the insecticide seemed to work quite effectively. So we had minimal damage from, from pests. The climate was um, shows the rainfall events here. We applied around about 400 to 450 millimetres of irrigation. The rainfall was between about 90 and 160 millimetres, which is probably around 60% of what we would normally get. It was a dry summer for us. Temperatures, um, it was slightly warmer but we didn't get any temperature extremes. So we didn't get any temperatures above 40 degrees. Um, and the soil temperature was around, sort of around that sort of um, about 14 to, to 20, 24 um, degrees during the trial. Plant establishment, our target number was around about 100, but we're targeting trying to get numbers above 60. As Mark said, that there was differences in that establishment, uh, most likely due to seed quality, but also um, probably where you had, particularly where you had that poor vigour, the earlier sowing um, affected the numbers also. Um, we looked also, did growth stage measurements, looking at the time of flowering and the proportion of male and female flowers. So um, as Mark showed, we had the dioecious and monoecious varieties. So I've got some information regarding the days to flowering and ratios. <clears throat> uh, we have harvested the crops and we have some, this is some preliminary data, but we don't have grain yields but this is um, showing differences in plant height. Again, um, we didn't put the fertiliser on time of sowing one, but uh, there doesn't appear to be any effect of the fertiliser on plant height for um, sowing time two and three. There was a difference, a big difference in plant height with the, the monoecious varieties. Uh, they were slightly later and also um, taller. Final harvest, we do have that data. As I said, we don't have the grain yield yet, yields yet. We're still processing that. Um, but we had up to around about seven tonne for that later sowing time for some of those monoecious varieties and only, you know, around that two tonne mark for some of the Katani and X59, which we felt we had a, a bit of an issue with seed quality. Again, not sure that there is an effect of um, fertilizer uh, at this stage. And so I'd just like to acknowledge um, the, na the national team and also locally our team um, at Hamilton, uh, um, Deb Partington, our biometrician, and Jamie, Greg, Irma, and Darren, who have done a lot of work on the trial. So thank you. Thanks, Penny. So do we have questions? Or Penny. We've got a question in the chat, but everyone else, I'd really encourage you to um, put forward your questions in the chat so that we can um, ask Penny or others in the group. But we've got a question here, uh, Mark, with respect to sowing dates, has anyone looked at growth stage where the crop cultivars will flip to reproductive stage if light duration is insufficient to maintain vegetative growth, especially at the earlier sowing dates? <coughs> So we are measuring growth stage. Um, so um, um, Penny mentioned that, that we have you know, days to flowering. Uh, so we're measuring growth stages uh, and we can 
uh, identify when the different varieties are triggering to flowering. Um, so that will be part of the data that we were able to produce. Um, so I guess the answer is yes. Thanks, Mark. I've got another question here. Um, does the water drain out of this? Oh, this is to Penny. Does the water drain out of this soil profile or held or is it held in the profile as in heavy clays? Uh, so the question is around what actually influenced the irrigation intervals? So being heavy clays, the water is generally held in there. We have a big issue with waterlogging, so we that it is held with it in the clay. It also means that if we get um, a lot of rainfall over winter, which we always do, we get the waterlogging, then there is quite a bit of water that is left in the profile that is available for summer cropping. But what influenced the um, reason for irrigation is that was water used by the crop. So the, the crop was sucking the water out and that's what the irrigation intervals were based on. Water use, crop water use. Thanks, Penny. Uh, Mark, there's no more questions um, in the chat at the moment. OK. All right, so the next site visit is to Myope, uh, which is near the Coonawarra uh, Wine District in South Australia. For anyone who um, is interested in wine, that gives you a context to where it is. Um, and this is a, a recorded video. Um, so, uh, Beck, if you can play that. Thank you. This is the Myo trail site for the IHVT program. Uh, so we're in the southeast or the limestone coast region of uh, South Australia, uh, just near the town of Panola and uh, just out the back of the Coonawarra wine region. Uh, so this uh, area is um, has plentiful groundwater resources uh, and lots of um, irrigated agriculture already, as well as dry land. Uh, a lot of the uh, irrigated agriculture is under centre pivots, um, rotational crops, seed crops and legumes. Uh, and so hemp fits into the rotation here quite nicely. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we have uh, a trial site in this district. Um, and uh, there are existing growers, so the property we're on is an existing hemp grower um, and he's hosting the trial site for us. So there are two times of sowing at this site. Uh, the first time of sowing was sown on the 18th of November um, and that's the plot to uh, this side of the, of the trial and then the ones directly behind me were sown on the 9th of December. Uh, it's now the 24th of February when we're filming this um, and some of the uh, trial, sorry, some of the varieties in the first time of sowing are ready for harvest. Um, the second time of sowing are not, they are slightly behind. Um, and some of the varieties in time of sowing one still have some distance to go before they'll be ready to harvest. So this variety is Katani. This is in the second time of sowing, so it's sown early December. Um, you can see that it's quite short compared to some of the other varieties that we'll look at shortly. Um, reasonably well developed even though it is uh, second time of sowing um, but it has a little way to go uh, before harvest. Plant density is a little bit patchy um, and we had a few issues with germination and establishment of this variety. The next variety is Hanola. Uh, so this is again second time of sowing. You can see it's much taller, still very green so this one isn't close to being harvested yet. Uh, has some time to go. Um, really good plant density, uh, good establishment, good emergence. Um, so yeah, it's looking pretty promising. CRS um, is the next variety. Similar height, slightly shorter and slightly more advanced um, than the uh, Hanola. Again, pretty good establishment, uh, good plant density, um, but will be a while yet before it's harvested. So they were all second time of sowing. We're now moving into the first time of sowing. So these varieties were all planted in November, mid-November. This variety, uh, that's CRS again. So this is time of sowing two CRS, time of sowing one CRS. Um, this one's obviously slightly more advanced and will be harvested fairly soon. 
The next variety is CFX2, a shorter variety again. Again, reasonably well advanced. Um, harvest will be soonish, uh, not just yet. Um, but yes, looking, looking okay. Again, reasonable establishment, reasonable plant density. This is X59. Um, this is another variety that we had some issues with emergence, uh, germination and emergence establishment. Um, and so the plant density is a little bit low. It's a short variety, uh, early variety. So that one, um, again, it's getting close to harvest uh, fairly soon. Um, but it hasn't, uh, I guess the, the problem we've had is with the plant density. So we're not expecting high yield from this one, but individual plants look okay. Um, just the plant density isn't there. So um, if we can get some seed that will be more robust um, in future years, that hopefully will help to establish how well this one will do. And the last variety is Ferrimin 12. So you can see this is one of the tallest varieties. It's also one of the latest. So this is, again, the first time of sowing, but it's a long way from uh, being harvested yet. Uh, still quite green. So um, yeah, that's, that's gonna be one of the last ones harvested. Um, it's taller mostly because it flowers later. So it spends more time growing um, and gets taller before it then flowers. You can see very long flower heads on it. Um, so, you know, on the face of it, looking pretty promising as well. Um, but I guess we'll wait and see when we harvest uh, to see how much there is actually in the crop. So this trial site was direct sown into an existing stubble. So there was a wheat crop here previously that was uh, cut for hay and then the hemp was sown straight into that and you can see some of that stubble still remaining here. So it was about this height all the way through in rows. The hemp was sown different machine so it wasn't precision sown between the stubble or anything it was just sown into that existing stubble. Um, and the stubble actually helped to protect the hemp seedlings as they came out of the ground. Uh, so any wind, um, dust uh, was broken up by the, the stubble and they had quite a protected um, uh, environment for the seedlings. The seedlings do tend to be quite um, sensitive and so it's important to keep them um, happy during that early stage. So the stubble and regular irrigation with the pivot uh, certainly helped with that and, and we got very good establishment at this site. So the soil at this site is uh, quite good. Um, it's a black clay loam. Uh, you can see it's quite um, crumbly but uh, quite open. It's fairly shallow, but underneath is limestone rubble, and so it actually drains really well. So that's an advantage. Hemp doesn't like uh, wet feet, waterlogging. So the drainage is really good, holds good water, uh, high organic matter, quite fertile already, and then we apply fertilizer to the crop anyway. Um, but one of the big advantages is we have very few issues with getting the seedlings um, emerging out of the ground. So we don't get crusting um, and so the seedlings don't have that problem of, of emerging. We sow very shallow here um, and uh, that seems to suit uh, the seeds. Um, the seeds germinate, the roots head down, the seedling comes out and, um, and they establish really quickly. Uh, so that, um, yeah, the soil is, is a, a real advantage and it's the same soil that's, you, that's right across this region um, and is used for uh, this irrigated um, cropping, rotational cropping that uh, the local farmers are practicing. Um, and uh, yeah, it's pretty nice. So the row width at this site um, is 20 centimeters between planting rows. Uh, and we actually do two runs with the um, cedar because it's got six rows planted on a run. So we do two runs for 12 rows. So that gives us about 2.4 meter width for our plots and the plots are 10 meters long. So this trial site is irrigated by center pivot. There was a hemp crop here previously 
um, that was irrigated by centre pivot. Then there was the wheat crop that was cut for hay. Um, and the same pivot has been here in irrigating those crops. It is the irrigation system of choice in this district uh, for most crops, but particularly hemp. All the hemp is grown under centre pivot. So that um, makes sense to put the trial site under the centre pivot. And the um, property owner has been very good to make sure that our trial site gets as much irrigation as it needs, even if his pasture doesn't. Um, he's made sure that, uh, that the irrigation happens when it needs to. I guess one issue with the centre pivot is the height of your crop and the height of your drop tubes. So here, uh, the hot drop tubes are a little under two metres off the ground. Um, our trial site, or sorry, our varieties that are here, uh, no more than about a metre and a half, so that's fine. Um, but if you get some of the taller varieties, that could be an issue um, and may need the, the drop tubes to be uh, lifted uh, or find other ways to make sure that the, the water's getting into the ground and to the crop um, and not getting too hung up in the foliage as it passes through. So the particular learnings from this trial site, uh, firstly, the direct drilling. Um, we've found that is actually really effective in this soil type may not suit every soil type but there are advantages in doing that um, where the soil is suitable because it does provide some protection to the young seedlings as they emerge um, and if you can direct drill without any other issues uh, it's certainly worth having a try. Um, the other main learning from this site is insect pressure. Uh, so we've had some heliothus issues but probably the biggest issue we've had at this site and I know it's been a lot of sites this year in particular is Rutherglen bugs. Last year at a, another trial site uh, that we, the South Australian government, were running separately, um, we had plots that were actually wiped out by Rutherglen bug. This year we had an infestation, it was treated chemically um, and there doesn't seem to be too much ongoing damage, but it is a, an ongoing issue for uh, hemp when the conditions are right, uh, rather glen bugs moving in from other um, crops or from native vegetation into the nice green lush hemp crop um, and uh, so control of rather glen is uh, an ongoing issue because they can have a, a pretty nasty effect on the crop. Okay, so that's the Myop trial site. Uh, do we have questions, Olivia? No, no questions at the moment. Um, anybody got anything they'd like to enter into the chat? Now's your chance. Oh, here we go. Uh, from Dave, we have, is there a risk of lodging with the taller, later flowering cultivar? And if so, can this be mitigated with lower nitrogen fertilizer rate to encourage thicker cell walls without affecting the harvest index? So um, we haven't had any issues with lodging uh, and I've seen some pretty impressive tall growers crops uh, with varieties like ferramen um, and that hasn't <laughs> seemed to be an issue. Um, the high, I, th I think generally at the higher planting, at the higher plant density, um, you you do get those tall and thinner plants, but they are so closely packed together that they tend to hold each other up. Um, so if you have, I guess, in our narrow plots, that's potentially an issue, but we haven't seen it. But in a commercial crop, um, I haven't uh, haven't heard any issues in our local industry anyway. Uh, I don't know whether anyone else has um, anything to share. John, do you have any thoughts on that? I think John might have just dropped out. He was there when I asked the question. And he he was. <laughs> <laughs> He's having issues, I think, with his internet. Um, so, yeah, the, as far as I'm aware, that, isn't, that hasn't been an issue. 
And certainly if the plants are less densely spaced, then they do develop um, thicker stems and um, more robust plants. So that's uh, it's less of an issue as well. Thanks, Mark. We've got a couple of more questions that have come in. So while we wait for John to come back online. Oh, here, here we he go, comes. John. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. The only thing I'd add there is probably it could be an issue at our trials when we have tall varieties growing beside shorter varieties. So we're going to have to account for that in our trial design in the future. I have not seen many hemp crops lodge at all. And I would be concerned of not having enough nitrogen in there in case that did result in the stems not being strong enough. So um, I'm not sure if re restricting nitrogen use would be positive on the strength of the straw or the stem. But yeah, it's certainly an issue, the fact that there are very many different heights of varieties available to us, which is good. All right. All right, great. We've got a couple more co uh, questions here. So the next one, green patches versus yellow. Do you know if this is due to nitrogen or water or a combination of both? So I'm assuming that's green patches within the within a crop as mm. opposed to green patches on a plant. I think um, so. <laughs> Penny, is Penny still here? Um, do you want to Penny's... talk a little bit more about what happened with your uh, yellowing issue and what you discovered when you did a nutrition test? Yeah, so we didn't um, really pick too much up. I'm not really sure what the cause of that yellowing was in the trial. Um, it didn't seem to be nutritional and when we put on the extra fertiliser, I don't think we've got a response. So um, we do have our soil type can be a little bit gill guide, so it could have been a little bit to do with the watering. Um, we did keep a lot of water on it, so possibly that could have been a reason. Um, but I don't think, you know, we it certainly was never flooded, um, but it might have been, a, you know, that could have led to a little bit of the, the patchiness. It, it seemed like it was more in the, um, the crops that had that poor seedling vigour as well. So even though we didn't really detect any disease as such, you know, some of those varieties, whether it was poor seedling vigour or just um, some of the breeding, that there's a little bit of variability within the crops. Um, you know, I'm not sure. As I said, it John? could be very localised soil type or, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that, uh, that unspecific yellowing in crops is always a tricky one. But I would say from my visits of that site twice now, I would suggest that it is soil related and the soil relationship would be some sort of water logging that results in nitrogen deficiency. Even though you didn't get a response, it might have been too late or you know further down in terms of um, not being able to get a nitrogen response. Yeah, all right, thank you. Anything else, Olivia? You're, you're on mute again. Apologies, we've got one more question. Um, so from James, is there a pro, oh, sorry, no, there's one before that. Any comments on accumulated heat unit versus nighttime length for triggering flowering? Um, so not so much from the current set of trials, but previous work that I've done suggests that there are some varieties that um, trigger on the basis of accumulated heat units and others that, uh, um, Certainly, waiting for daylight or day length change, um, and of you know some of the previous data that we've collected shows two quite different patterns. Um, so that does seem to be varietal, um, but that's on a fairly limited um, range of varieties that we've tested as well. Thank you. And just one last question. Is there a protocol in the trial design to test the residual traces of chemicals in biomass? No, there isn't currently. So maybe that's something we can take on board uh, and talk about when we review the protocols. John's waving at me, so <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a, yeah, John's on mute now, so you're on mute, John. I was waving at a new entrant who just arrived. He's oh, taken yeah. them all morning to get on, so I was happy to see him. Uh, right. Uh, 
Yes, okay. look, that is something that we can we can talk about uh, when we review our tri trial protocols. Um, I guess the, you know, e everything we test for costs money, so um, we can't test for everything. Um, and and there's a f yeah, it's an interesting question. And certainly, it's something that we'll consider. Yeah. And that's it for now, Mark. Okay. So um, and next. Uh, trial site visit is to Epping Forest in Tasmania. Now I know um, Jason was having issues getting on earlier, but yeah, there he is. I can see him, so he has managed to join us. Um, so Jason um, Lynch is a senior consultant with, uh, in agribusiness with Pinion Advisory, uh, based in Devonport in Tasmania, and he's managing the Epping Forest IHVT trial site. So I'll hand over to Jason, and you're on. You're on mute. That's better. Yep. Uh, hello. Jason, you're on mute you're on again. You're on mute again. On mute again. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks so much to AgriFutures for uh, putting on the webinar. Um, I'll just pull up the presentation. Hopefully, everyone can see that. Um, so. Uh, the Epping Forest Trial Site, uh, it's, it's uh, based in the central northern Midlands of Tasmania. This is a, a pretty typical and representative area for broadacre cropping. Uh, low rainfall, um, hemp's quite a, a relatively common crop uh, now growing in Tasmania, and there's commercial crops uh, spread about this area. Um, so, uh, Soils in this area they are quite typical of what we would see, um, relatively deep grey brown sandy loam. Look, there's nothing tremendous about the soils themselves uh, apart from they hold roots. Um, uh, the site itself has been out of a pasture phase uh, and recent cropping history includes uh, canning peas, forage brassicas, potatoes and grass seed. So uh, the site itself has been in pasture for the last couple of years. Uh, the site was quite flat, a um, little bit of lateral flow, and we'll come to this about some of the waterlogging issues that we did experience. Um, as I said, this is a dry area of Tasmania. Um, typical rainfall is around 563 millimetres. Uh, during the trial site, principally that sort of core vegetative growth period, um, from the start of December to the end of January, we had about 76 millimetres of rainfall. Um, uh, it was a very challenging year though. Leading into this, we had an exceptionally wet season. Then the clouds stopped, the rain finished up, and we went into a very dry, hot period. Uh, we, as Mark indicated, uh, our uh, assessments were based on six varieties, four replicates for each variety. These were planted in 10 metre beds, each bed 1.2 metres long. Um, and we had two sowing dates, uh, late November and early December, so 28th of November and the 8th of December. These sowing dates are probably arguably two weeks later than what we would like, but a combination of access to equipment and certainly driven by the seasonal conditions really push those dates back. So normally in Tasmania, we'd be sowing in the first half of November. Uh, here are the varieties that were assessed. Um, Mark's already gone through those. Uh, we've got grain and dual purpose varieties, uh, a mixture of dioecious and monoecious lines. Um, for Tasmania, CRS1 and CFX2, they are well recognised uh, as commercial varieties and have been grown for many years. So um, very good to be able to see what we consider uh, a couple of industry standards against these new lines. So just the trial site details, you can see on the right hand side there, um, light textured sandy soils. Um, site was sprayed off with glyphosate and carfetrazone ethyl or hammer, um, shallow dist, and then uh, surface cultivated and drilled subsequently with that, uh, with an air seeder. As I mentioned, we had dry conditions throughout the growing season. So pretty much within a couple of days after the site was sown, we had the irrigators going in there and they weren't really allowed to uh, come out of there throughout the season. Um, irrigating approximately every four to six days with around about 20 millimetres of uh, irrigation. 
Uh, no pre-emergent herbicides were applied, but we did do a little bit of work with some bromicide in there. Uh, principal intake out, we had a bit of a, an early issue with swine press, and then we used some clethid in to take care of a couple of uh, areas where we had quite a bit of uh, grass weeds in there. Um, uh, look, those of you that have uh, dealt with hemp, uh, you think you've got good weed control until the crop starts to open up as it matures, and uh, then you start seeing a few weeds get away. So we did have some weed issues at the end, and that is uh, what we see many, many times with uh, hemp crops. Uh, in late January, early February, we started to see signs of heliacus coming in. Uh, we treated this with Dominex. Uh, a lot of Tasmanian producers would use Vivus. Uh, we did use Dominex, so alpha cypermethrin. Um, we got a very, very good result out of it, which you normally get a little bit nervous with Dominex. Uh, different to normal processes, the grower actually put it on at a very, very high water rate. So it was around 300 litres per hectare, um, took care of all the heliothis from um, small little one centimetre grubs through to, uh, you know, maybe snakes that were starting to get up to two and a half centimetres, but very successfully controlled. Uh, here's what we did with fertiliser. So it's sowing, we had a compound fertiliser, 200 kgs a hectare. 21 days later, there was a repeat application of that and then 42 days after sowing. So um, the fertiliser applications were made in response to the soil tests. Uh, we did in-crop soil nitrate testing. Uh, started out with a good amount of soil nitrate. Uh, I think the levels were around about 114, 115 kilos of nitrate nitrogen. Uh, after all that nitrogen was applied uh, in late seed maturity or just prior to um, harvest, we went through, did another soil nitrate, and we were down to below 10. So uh, in total, the crop had access to uh, around about 200 kilos of nitrate nitrogen, but uh, it, um, it had very little left at the end of it. Uh, so what are the outcomes that we saw? Look, um, we had a large amount of uh, assessments and observations made on the various crop plots and plantings. Uh, this included everything, uh, as previously mentioned, um, plant density, growth stage development, flowering dates, uh, susceptibility to pest and disease. I've got to say, we didn't notice significant disease pressure. Um, a little bit came in late, but that was probably more after harvest, uh, change of seasons uh, in early March. We get a little more dew sitting on the leaf, but um, it didn't appear that it would have been an um, issue to impact yield. Um, pest pressure was uniform in terms of, we saw heliothis right across the plot. Um, and we also looked at uh, percentage of males and females. Uh, seed yields have been checked as well. Um, samples are ready to go for THC testing and uh, we'll look at seed quality uh, subsequently. Uh, these assessments, they're compiled, uh, seeds being cleaned as we speak now and uh, separating out the um, veggie material that's uh, been accumulated there. Um, look, as anyone would expect when you're looking at different varieties, there were very clear differences. Um, as, uh, as mentioned, we did have some seedling uh, germination, some vigour issues. Um, but, you know, overall, uh, nice clear differences and very good to be able to compare to some of the industry standards uh, as what we know. Um, what problems did we have? Look, uh, pretty challenging season in Tasmania to grow crop starting very wet. Uh, very dry and hot thereafter. We did have a couple of soil water logging issues, damaged two of the um, replicates. Had a little bit of late season weed pressure, but that's quite normal when you grow hemp. Um, started off with some seed germination and seedling vigour issues. And look, we had some deer and bird pressure. Um, the deer didn't appear to come in and actually eat the, eat the hemp, but um, they do like hanging out in there. It provides some shelter. So um, we had some electric fencing going around it, but um, yeah, they're pretty good at uh, skipping over. Um, bird pressure, look, uh, it's a great indicator of when seed maturity starts to occur, um, when the parrots and uh, starlings start to come in. But, um, you know, we, we had limited opportunity, but um, bird pressure did uh, start to come in towards the end. What are the wins that we had? Look, despite being a particularly challenging growing season, you know, it was dry and hot, uh, the host grew the crop well, as best as he could. Um, we've collected a large amount of data, so there's going to be quite a lot of uh, analysis 
going through in time. Uh, and look, definitely to be able to compare known varieties and how they perform with CFX and CRS to these new varieties, which we've seen maybe a little bit, maybe a Pheromon and Catani in the past, but um, you know, to have industry standards and say, well, we know what these are going to do and uh, be able to understand and appreciate what's uh, happening into the future. I've got a lot of acknowledgements. There's been a lot of people that have helped. So um, AgriFutures Australia and the Tasmanian government for funding uh, the program, uh, Tim Smith and uh, the Tasmanian Hemp Association, um, Mark Skews and all the um, IHB team, John Muir and uh, the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture coming on board to help clean and prepare the seed and southern farming systems. And I'm done. Thanks, Jason. Do we have questions for Jason? We don't at the moment, but I'd strongly encourage everyone to think about any questions and pop them into the chat. Um, think about what you might like to ask if you're actually there and not virtual, <laughs> wandering the fields. While people are thinking about that, um, I would like to say, as Mark pointed out earlier, due to COVID limitations, we did go online for our virtual field day this year, but we do hope in subsequent years, COVID permitting, um, to actually hold these in field <laughs> as originally planned. Yep. Okay. okay. I don't think we've got any more, Mark, so I think yep. we can proceed. All right. So uh, our next presentation is going to be from John Muir. So John is the agronomist for the uh, Industrial Hemp Variety Trial Program. Uh, he works for Hemp Farming Systems in South East Queensland. Um, and uh, he's going to talk about some of the general agronomic issues and learnings that we've had through the uh, first year of the IHVT. So, John, over to you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Olivia. And thanks to all the team that's uh, been able to put this together. Um, I do apologise. I'm recovering from COVID after the conference and also two field days we've had since then. So. I was able to dodge the bullet until last night. So um, I've just come down and we're having some IT issues as well. Please bear with us. Um, I also want to thank and acknowledge the fact that Hemp Farming Systems was chosen to uh, be involved in the uh, national trials. I think it's a great opportunity to not only get the varieties and people out and sharing knowledge and information, uh, but having days like today as well. Um, I've had the pleasure of being able to visit four of the seven sites twice now, including an audit. So um, my my comments are not just from reports and fit and co comments and fit and telephone conversations, but actually on site uh, visual inspections and sampling and detailed discussion. I also want to acknowledge the fact that some of the trial sites had never grown hemp, yet alone seen it. So. We did some early training in the early days, and I want to take my hat off to those people that had took the challenge of saying, well, let's learn about hemp and let's see what we can do. And I might add that some of them were one of the, some of the best trials we've had, uh, the people that are still learning as a result of those quick sh short training sessions we had. I'd also like to acknowledge the fact that two of the seven sites are on farmers' fields. So in Tasmania, and in uh, South Australia, uh, we had the pleasure to work actually on fields. And I often feel like research stations are sometimes limited in what you can do or restricted or in the soil types. Whereas when you're working on a hemp farm, you're actually working in the real world of the hemp farmer's field. And it really does relate to what's out there in the real world. Um, uh, I just want to now start on some of the issues that were raised. If you bear with me. Um, so some of the main challenges, I think I'm going to repeat a lot that's been said because I'm summarising basically, and so Mark will be as well at the end. So I'm just repeating and reinforcing what's been said. So number one, severe weed infestation can be a problem in hemp. It's, it, it's also a problem because we have very limited chemical options to control it. Certainly, as Mark said, direct drilling is one way you, you can control it by not disturbing the seed bed and controlling it pre-sowing. 
Um, and we've also got a problem with one of the very limited few chemicals we have to control broadleaf weeds post-emergent are sometimes phototoxic to some varieties. So it's very hard to decide whether we can put a chemical over the trial site if one of the trial um, varieties is toxic or sorry, is uh, reactive to that chemical. So it does cause a challenge. We are fortunate enough to have four grass control chemical herbicides available, all under the AVPMA, of course. Um, so it does mean that grasses generally are not an issue, but it, but we do have problems with broad leaves and it'll be an ongoing problem until we've had, we've just had a major review of the AVPMA, thanks to AgriFutures. So hopefully that'll highlight some of the gaps that are needed in the future for this crop. You've heard a lot today also about soils, and I do believe the answer lies in the soil. And sometimes we think, looking at the drone photos in particular, soil variations are occurring in the plots, including waterlogging, variability, patchy growth, establishment, and subsequent uneven growth. So that's a challenge we have on any site we go to, but that's why we use the replicates and the detailed statistical analysis to try and make up for those problems. But I often will repeat to say that uh, farmer fields are often the best uniform fields we can find, just, just so you know that that's another reason why we use farmer fields. The other issue we heard and challenge was low establishment counts, and a lot of that was due to poor establishment, sorry, it was due to poor seed vigor, seed size, and seed germination. So in the future, everyone knows that hemp has to be stored well in cool storage, otherwise the germination and the vigor and the uh, quality of the seed declines and it causes huge problems in the establishment phase. Hemp is critical to get uniform establishment. If you don't, it will thin itself. So not only will we get competition from weeds, but hemp seedlings that are germinated a few days before its brothers and sisters next door, it will mean that it'll actually compete out. So when we talk about uh, establishment, we've got to look at establishment right through to the final harvest yield. So we've had situations where 200 plants per square meter resulted in less than 60 at final harvest, just due to competition and poor uneven establishment. Nutrition. I think nutrition is a big issue in hemp. There's a lot of work being done on it, and there's a lot of talk of what it needs or what it doesn't need by some people. Uh, but I think we really need to look at the whole nutrition of uh, nutrients and not not only just the nutrients, but I think we look at, need to look at soil biology and soil physical structure that make this hemp grow or not. I think we really need to look at what is the best way to prepare a seed bed, either direct drilled or not, so that the adequate nutrients are available and the biology. I'm now going to move on to issues raised, and some of these are repeated, but please bear with me. So one of the big issues was growth stages, just trying to identify, as someone said, the flowering stage, the establishment phase, and the physiological maturity stage for harvest. Particularly with the new varieties we're getting, these monoecious varieties, we've seen dioecious mainly up to now, but now that we're getting more monoecious varieties, they are very different with males and females on the same head, and it is tricky, I assure you, uh, as we've all tried over the last few months to identify the flowering stage, the grain filling stage, and the lastly, the physiological maturity stage. So that's something I think everyone needs training in and just sharing of information and knowledge. I think we've also seen the advantage of narrow rows. Um, you heard some rows were 10 inch and 12 inch wide. I believe hemp loves being spread out as far and wide apart as possible for that spatial distancing. I think it's got something to do with COVID. They like being separated from each other. And in doing so, narrow rows of 150 to 775 mils, the old six to seven inch spacing, I think is what we need to consider more and more in our plantings in the future. I also believe we need to understand the soil, the water content and the weather data. Um, we, we sometimes collect all this and then don't put it to use. So I'm just thinking we need to collect the data and help 
and use that data to make better irrigation decisions, especially in scheduling. We just don't have to throw water at this crop. It doesn't like it too much and it doesn't like it too little. So we've got to find that niche point, that really niche point where it operates at its best. And on top of that, I think we therefore need to probably do more soil and plant nutrition. And I saw a question there from Stuart Larson, what tissue test is being done? So I think that's a great question, uh, Stuart, that we probably do need to do a bit more in-crop plant tissue testing and soil biology so we can make better decisions. Lastly, recommendations for the future. I've been told not to mention some of these, so I'll just say to the fact that um, some of these issues are outside the scope of the uh, project, and that's fine. So I do believe after a wet, I know Penny didn't have a wet summer, but I tell you what, we've had water logging so much in some crops commercially this year that the irrigation crops look poor and the dry land crops look better than the irrigation. And to that point, I think we need as an industry to look at dry land varieties, particularly in the higher rainfalls in Southern Australia, and also certainly in the North where the summer rains are more dominant anyway. I need to look at late and mid maturing. You saw Shahar there in his crops waiting for Ruby and Han and to finish. I think we need to see more of those dual purpose and multi-cropping grain and biomass purpose crops in the future. I do believe we need to put them and consider them in the trials for the future. I personally would love to see early sowing dates. I'm talking hemp comes from the cooler climate. It comes from cold and snow and ice. So it's unlike other summer crops, it can germinate at 10 degrees. So I, I believe we need to consider early sowing in spring to allow growth in that cooler, moist spring we get in Southern Australia, especially in dry land, if we're growing it. And so we can get it off before Christmas, the new year. It'd be like a safflower crop where it used to fit in. So that's the thing. We need to look at where this plant can grow within the windows of planting, flowering and harvesting and see where they fit into those um, into those windows in the local areas. Um, that's about it, really. Thanks very much. Cheers, John. Thank you. Um, so do we have, I think there's been a few comments and questions going through. Um, so do we have questions to John? I can, I can add one more thing if I can. Um, it was a unique for, year for insects and Rutherglen bugs did kill 30 hectares of a seedling crop. And it really surprised us of that intensity of, of in, infestation. And secondly, that Ruther, the Rutherglen bug is, is, is shocking. That's sorry, the Rutherglen bug certainly killed a lot of seedlings this year. And secondly, Red-legged earth mites were really shocked in one of our trials. So to have them there at the seedling stage of a summer crop was also very surprising. Thanks, Mark. Questions? Uh, John, just a point of clarification. Somebody has asked, um, are we looking for precision planting at cereal row widths? Absolutely. This plant loves being separated. If you are clumping seeds together with a dodgy seeder and having big gaps between clumps of seed, you will lose most half of those seedlings because they won't come to anything because the dominant seed will survive. So you're just wasting seed. So we are after planting precision down the row and between the row being narrow as possible. Great, thanks, John. Um, and another question. Do you think some of the soil variation issues can be solved with VRT and NDVI type technologies to reduce weed competition? That one might be above my pay grade, Mark. How about you? Can you, what was the first part of the question again? Uh, do you think some of the soil variation issues soil variation. can be solved right. with um, technologies to reduce weeds? Um, potentially some of the soil variability could be um, accounted for with NDPI and, and precision um, agriculture technologies. I'm not sure we controllers, I mean, we controllers limited by what we've got available. So um, 
but uh, if it's nutritional, um, you know, potentially. Uh, water logging is another issue. There's, there's a lot of work, work going on in precision irrigation, but it's difficult stuff. Uh, and under pivots, not so bad. There's, there's a fairly well-developed stuff in, in pivots. So, yeah, potentially. Yeah. Maybe, Mark, if someone could offer to provide such technology to uh, agri-future trial sites, we would consider it as a potential innovative uh, option. Yeah. Our, plot, our plot sizes are probably small enough that there's not much you can do anyway. So, yeah. 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 There was just another point, just an add-on, um, if you wanted to add anything further around establishment and early vigour in particular. Um, oh, look, I think, you know, the, the better the seed is, the more, um, the better uh, spacings that we can have it planted at um, and get it up and out of the ground quickly, uh, look after it early to get it going, um, you know, that, that all has um, a lot of implications down the track uh, for the maturing crop, John. And of course, we must not forget the seed size. We have hemp seeds as, yep. as small as 60,000 seeds per kilo and some large selected seeds at 30,000. So straight away, your sowing rates uh, are 100% different. So seed size is critical for the vigour and establishment of any hemp seedling. And it has to be taken into effect for seeds per square metre, not kilos per hectare. Yep. Uh, just a, another question. With the current high fertiliser prices, this crop, um, can you grow this crop with minimum fertiliser inputs? Well, if you Google hemp, everyone says it doesn't need fertiliser. So um, this crop loves fertiliser, particularly soil biology. It really responds to high organic matter, high biology, high carbon soils. Um, one of the other issues we found was that hemp hasn't grown deep into the soils. Um, we had some Polish breeders with us saying, we have measured soil roots down to a metre. Well, I ordered it, you know, several crops, including private crops, and we have not seen any hemp roots dug up with a shovel, not pulled out of the ground, more than 30 centimetres. So um, to answer your question, if you can have soil biology in that top soil, um, we certainly believe and growing a green manure crop before hemp, we would love that. Um, so yeah, we have to look at, with prices going up, look at alternative methods. And I think we have to look at timing of fertilizer, not maybe putting up a lot of amount, a lot up front, but then working out how to put it as the crop establishes and the yield looks good, you then feed it on its potential yield, not just put all your eggs in one basket up front and the crop might fail or, or not perform as well. So having options of when to use fertiliser and how much, and with those tests, as Stuart Larson mentioned, making ha making better decisions, that's all needed for, for high-yielding hemp crops. Thanks, John. Um, just a couple of last questions, and then we might pass back to Mark just to, for final wrap-up. So, Viga, is it related to seed size? And then a comment, the tap roots, um, I think they're called tap roots as uh, I think the tap roots as they are called are laterals chasing triple water down the profile. But the question is really around bigger and is it related to seed size? I'll let Mark have a go at this as well, please. <laughs> He's the irrigation guru. But um, you mentioned laterals. Hemp has the hugest lateral surface feeding roots I've ever seen. Look at police try to pull mar marijuana out of the ground. It's impossible. We were trying to pull crops out of the ground yesterday and it was impossible, even though they were only 20, 30 centimetres deep. Um, so the surface feeding roots are humongous. And maybe that's just telling us that's where the nutrient in the water is. Um, back to Vigor, yes. Vigor um, is germination percentage, seed size, and then it's what's happened. Is, has the oil been denatured? Has it broken down? Has it been heated? Has it been affected? Has it got seedling diseases? Um, seedling seed treatment is another issue we need to consider for fungus and insecticides. So, and then there are biological agents they put on seeds as well. So it's a huge area of unknown for hemp, and that's why we've got exciting 
trials such as this with AgriFutures happening to unsolve some of these unknown questions. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Now, I'll just back up most of what John just said, particularly with the seed. But yes, larger seed will, on the face of it, be more, you know, produce more vigorous seedlings because they've got more reserves to get them going before they're producing their own uh, food through photosynthesis. But, you know, a big seed, if it's been stored poorly and, and is, you know, the oil's denatured and, and the, the um, you know, the seedlings not very viable anymore, um, you know, a big seed is not going to be any better than a small seed that has been looked after well and, and um, you know, has, has still got good vigour in it. So there's a whole lot of factors affecting that. Temperature. Can I throw in temperature as well? Yes. Um, uh, Olivia, there's a, some new research that's just been shown that as we've been trying to plant hemp in the middle of summer, which I said is challenging because I also suggested it's used to being planted in cooler, cooler uh, snow and, dare I say, permafrost soils. Um, when we plant it in the heat of summer, the soil temperature is over 50 bloody degrees and therefore little hemp seedlings are saying, I don't like it. So what the research has found up in Ord and Kununurra, and I'm sure maybe King is uh, on this webcam, but... Um, I'd love to hear her share that knowledge even more. The fact that the further they push the seed into the ground, away from the surface heat, the establishment improved. Direct link between the deeper you sowed it, the further away you got from the surface heat, the higher the establishment. And I think that's just something we all got to reflect on. But that does need good, vigorous seed to be able to get out of the ground from further yeah, down. Yeah. So yeah, there yeah. are interactions happening there. Yeah. Okay. So um, Olivia has had to leave us for another meeting. So oh, thank God. you, Olivia, for uh, your input today. Um, and I just have a, a quick um, wrap up and where to next session to finish off. Um, so, firstly, I'd like to thank all the presenters. Um, that's been uh, excellent um, input from them and particularly thank you for keeping to time uh, because that's helped us to keep the whole uh, morning on time. Um, the, in terms of wrap up and the, the learnings that we've, we've made, you know, we've heard a lot of different things. Um, plant population has been one of those things that's been uh, a key uh, item that we've discussed. Um, so we talked about seed quality, seeding rate, seedling vulnerability, and the way that that then impacts on weed control as well. So there's a lot of interaction there and, and um, information that, that is uh, being generated. Just on that, one of the things that we're going to discuss uh, as part of our review of the trial protocols is whether we need to increase our target plant population from 100 to 150 plants per square metre. Um, and that's something we'll discuss. Um, some varieties, that's probably not necessary. 100 plants per square metre is, is quite good, but there are other varieties where perhaps even at 100 plants, if we get that successfully, um, you know, the, the plants are shorter um, and not providing that weed smothering. So that's something we'll discuss. Um, pest issues we've talked about as well, um, and uh, so that's an ongoing challenge, I guess. Um, I mentioned earlier Catherine and Kununurra sites, and I just want to um, acknowledge that those sites are ongoing and will be planting shortly. Um, so King and, um, and the Northern Territory team um, will be planting at uh, those two sites and will um, hopefully have either in-person field days, if possible, or we may do another uh, web-based event for that. Um, also, the discussions ongoing with New South Wales and Queensland to get some trial sites uh, in those areas as well. And that's something that we um, uh, is, is an ongoing discussion, um, and hopefully we will have those sites in the second year. The other thing is that we want to have more varieties in the trial. So the, the number of varieties we're currently testing is quite limited. Um, and there's an expression of interest being released, I believe, tomorrow um, for seed companies to offer varieties for uh, inclusion in year two and year three. 
Um, so please consider that. Please, uh, if you know of varieties that um, are out there uh, that we haven't got, talk to the suppliers of those, the owners of those varieties or suppliers of seed um, about getting those varieties into the IHVT trials. Because the more we have, the more information we're going to generate. Um, Agrifutures are also looking at where other investment in the hemp industry uh, should be made. Um, so, you know, is it nutrition trials? Is it irrigation trials? Uh, what are the what are the things that are needed? So that's separate to this IHVT program, um, but it is ongoing um, work that uh, Agrifutures are looking into. So keep. Um, your eyes open and ears open for those and there's potential opportunity to have input into what those should be um, going forward. And so finally I just ask if there are any final questions. If you have uh, questions later you can send them to programs at agrifutures.com.au and they will get fed through and potential for um, one of the trial site um, uh, managers or myself or John to um, to provide answers to those questions on one-on-one -on -one basis. But um, are there any immediate questions before we call this a day? And Beck's managing that now, so I'm looking at her, and she's not not giving me any. <laughs> no, nothing no? extra has come through just yet. All right. Well, look, I'd just uh, like to thank you all for your attendance and attention. I know that a few few people have had technical issues and, and dropped out and come back in a few times. Uh, so thank you for persisting, persisting with that. Uh, thank you to our presenters today. Um, and, uh, yeah, invite you to, if you have any questions uh, that, that come to mind later, please submit them and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. But, um, yeah, thank you all. and. Uh, all the best. Goodbye.